Okay, it's time. Let's go ahead and start. So I'm actually seeing more remote users uh, than the in-class uh, attenders. So this is actually a good thing. Consider that this is a, a modern skill to pick up. How to learn by, re uh, by watching videos. Okay. And quickly, the announcements are just two. One is exam number one is coming up. Well, actually not next week, actually two days after. Okay, I need to make an edit of that. Okay, starting from uh, 120 sharp to 210 sharp. Okay, so there are quite a few details uh, that you do want to pay attention to. So if you just uh, add uh, this channel, count uh, exam one, and then uh, check out all the details there. So let me just take you quickly there. So there are a few things, right? You see, oh, point number one coming up, it's uh, at this day, at this time, and it, exam scope is such and such. And um, so all exams are here, and then uh, it's going to be a Google form, so you could actually try things out by the, going through the Google form for last year's midterm. Of course, the last year we only have two exams, so the exam is um, the scope is much wider. And uh, during the break today, there's going to be a test uh, Google Me session. So this is uh, especially for the remote students. So guys, yeah, so make sure that you're tuning um, and uh, make sure you're at the place where you plan to take the uh, the exam and have the camera. Okay, positioned uh, at the at the angle so that we could see your headshot. Okay. Now, with all those said, uh, good news. Um, so we won't be able to lock down the browsers. Okay. So that means the remote students will have access to the internet and textbook or you know cheat sheets in any forms, which means guys. Okay, coming to take the exams in class, you would also have internet access. You can also bring your textbook, your favorite novel, in case that's too much time. <laughs> you have too much time. Um, yeah. So it's completely, look at this, open book and open internet. Right. Uh, but, 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 uh, looking things up take time. You see, we only have 15 minutes to work on the exam question. Uh, and if you go down a little bit further, so I'll let you guys read the postscript in detail. Okay. Um, so, oh, here, point number seven. The exam is super long by design. Okay. Uh, chance is very low that you have the time to finish all questions. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so it's more an exam to try to make sure that you are somewhat familiar with the concepts we've talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, in the process, uh, you might also need to look things up a little bit. <laughs> okay. Um, I understand that uh, it's going to be a little bit challenging taking an exam in this form. So. It's very normal if you couldn't finish the exam, if you couldn't answer all the questions. Right? So it's completely normal uh, when you are working on an exam like this, you won't have the time to finish all. Okay? Therefore, we advise you, okay? after filling out the basic form, skim through all the questions okay? and start from the questions that are easier. Okay? 
And uh, before you start answering questions, try to sum submit an empty form first, okay? That way you receive an email from Google saying that this is the link to the exam or to the form. So you can always come back to continue filling up the form, form okay? And why do you want to do that? This is so that you don't lose everything in case there's network outage. So, oh, yeah, some of the questions actually ask you to log into the PA server. And so make sure that you have the VPN ready if you're not okay, working on the exams from within NTU. Okay, guys, okay, uh, remote students, make sure that you have VPN convenience set up. Um, oh, and lastly, the exam scope. Uh, last week I have announced that uh, it's going to cover what we will be talking about today. Okay, uh, we'll we'll not cover chapter two at all. Okay, in this exam, because uh, I don't want to devastate you too much. Okay, so what I'm gonna say, what I'm trying to say is that the exam questions are reasonable. It's not hard. It's just that the time you have is a little bit short. Uh, so this is a. Uh, Fortunate or a little unfortunate because uh, uh, we will have to open book and open internet. Okay. So that's it. Okay, welcome to chapter two. Okay, are you happy to finally going into a real protocol layer? All right. Section one, yeah, a lot of basic terms, concepts, design elements, um, design considerations. Uh, we're going to spend quite a bit of time here, in fact. Okay, Just be prepared. And then we'll be spending also some time in Chapter 2.2. This is uh, one of the key applications uh, supporting actually our everyday life. That is the World Wide Web. And the application layer protocol that's uh, keeping the web running is this, HTTP. Now, I'm going to insert uh, one more protocol which is not touched down in textbook called the FTP as that uh, some of us are still using it a lot. Okay, That is mainly a protocol to support file transfer uh, such as uh, what's implemented in FileZilla. Okay? And the secure version of it is called the secure FTP. 2.3, we'll be learning all these protocols to support email. So many of us uh, write emails a lot. I guess some of the younger ones are no longer writing emails, but uh, many of us, especially professional people, are still using a lot of emails. It's very good to know uh, how email system operates. And then the DNS, I try to explain extensively up there. It's a huge, huge architecture behind. Oh, really? No stream? That's odd. Oh, okay. Let's, let's find out. I have already started streaming, and uh, let's see. Uh, it seems to be okay. Uh, let's see. Can you guys check real quick? Is it blank on the live video? That's odd. So maybe I stop and start again. Start. Yeah, I see the numbers rising, uh, but uh, did you guys see the video? Okay, um, I hope that the student... Ah, I see. So I think it's probably just the live chat not working. Okay, guys, can you see the videos now? Is
It seems like the screen is stopped. Okay. The camera working, but not the rest. <laughs> Still can see video. No. Okay. Huh? It works on your computer, but not on others. That's odd. Okay, let me try this. Could be because it needs to be refreshed. Or maybe it's just stopped. Okay, so this looks more like uh, what we're seeing, isn't it? Okay, I think I figured it out. Uh, that's LBJ, the interface to the, the, the screen I have here. That is mislinked. I just, uh... Great, great. Thank you, Shu Yu. <laughs> Good that, that we have remote students, okay, who are not entirely remote. <laughs> All right, so let's continue on. So basically, in Chapter 2, we'll be studying these uh, application lawyer protocols for the popular apps. Of DNS servers. You do want to know how the DNS servers are interconnected. Uh, that's going to help you design applications as well, even though it sounds like a sort of a core services to support internet operation. Not exactly an application. And then 2.5, uh, you will see how P2P networks can be designed, how P2P services can be designed. We'll also see a couple examples. One of them is called the BitTorrent. So that is the major P2P services that's before uh, Bitcoin. Uh, we are going to see uh, what's behind BitTorrent's uh, operation. We'll also describe a bit more of another P2P application called Skype. And then we'll also be spending quite a bit time here in 2.6 as many of us are using uh, streaming services over the internet extensively such as YouTube such as what you're doing now uh, watching the online lecture all right so we'll be doing video streaming uh, and content distribution network is there to support video streaming um, but let me just say that although um, we said that content distribution network is there to support video streaming, but most of these streaming services are operating based on the client server model, just to clarify. It's not like that the content distribution network is in architecture itself. And then briefly in 2.7, we're going to introduce the concept of socket programming, um, but much of this I'm going to just duplicate and repeat uh, again and again in PA 3 and 4, where we'll begin to do socket programming using Go, all right? But um, in chapter 2.7 and 2.8, you will see uh, the goal of the textbook author is so that um, we take you through how one implements a web server uh, using the network socket. Um, so one could do this using other programming languages, not only the Go and uh, such as Python, uh, such as Java. Okay, so Golan, I tried to justify why we use this language at the you know, beginning of the semester. Now, let's move on. Before we talk about the concepts, let's talk about these applications so that you get a better idea. I keep saying network application, network applications. What are these network applications? Well, first of all, Look at this, email. Um, some of you have uh, emailed me before. So those uh, email clients that you're using to type up your emails, yeah, this, uh, that is part of the email services, part of the email application. And uh, 
going to the course page, for example, then you'll be using the web service. Text messaging. Yeah, some of you guys might be now typing live on the live chat. That is a text messaging service. Now, some of you have already messaged me um, uh, through the messenger, okay, the Facebook's messenger. That is also a text messaging service. For and those who direct message me over Slack, that's also messaging. In fact, the whole Slack pretty much text messaging. Many of the domestic students, you guys are probably lining each other a lot. So line is one of the most popular text messaging app uh, in Taiwan. Remote locking. Yeah, mm, let's see. Have you done this before? Oh, yes, you did. Um, for PA1, PA2, I think you've tried it out already, right? Doing SSH. Yeah, SSH belongs to also this category called the remote locking. Uh, it's just that the SSH is more a secure remote, uh, remote locking. P2P function, if you have experience uh, using BitTorrent before, then you will see what I'm saying here. A peer-to-peer -peer based file sharing system. Um, Bitcoin. Bitcoin is P2P all right, but uh, it's not exactly file sharing, but it's more directory sharing, uh, content sharing. Okay, so yeah, you can think of P2P file sharing a bit more generally as P2P content sharing. So those are very common. Uh, the next few, it really depends on your habit. Uh, you might use some of these more than we do, uh, but you might also use uh, these less than we do. So first, I see that uh, I think some of you uses these more, the games. The mobile games or the regular online games you play on the desktop, those are multi-user network games. So some of the architecture of these multi-user games could be quite complicated, and transmission of the game data can also be uh, a bit hard to do. Right? Next, uh, YouTube, yeah, streaming stored video. So streaming services, there's a more official name, streaming stored video. And then over this side, uh, right side of the side, you see, these are for the teleconferencing. So voice over Skype is one of the teleconferencing means. In fact, in Skype, you can also do video conferencing. Nowadays, we have Zoom. Uh, that's another choice that's popular. Uh, Google Hangout, some of you might still be using it. Uh, I think there are more and more rising these days uh, with the virus situation getting worse. So the university is advising us to use this system called the U system. Well, maybe eventually we'll give it a try, but for now, just so that you know, U is also one of these teleconferencing services. Have you used the U? Yes, hmm. for other courses. How does it work? Uh, I mean, how well it works? No, no comments. Okay, nothing particular, okay. Well, there's video, there's audio, but they are not quite streaming stored video we were talking about here. Because these audio video are actually very interactive live. Not quite like what we're doing here. We're actually doing it um, semi live. Having 10 to 20 seconds delay is barely live, sorry. It's barely real, uh, real time. And then social network. For this course, sorry, um, you have to use Facebook a lot. Um, well, Facebook is quite reliable, although that um, it has less regard. So I actually changed from Facebook to Slack, you see. So that's the reference I had uh, last year about our privacy um, hopefully you don't mind too much uh, being on Facebook just for the semester all right so social networking oh, by the way I actually get objections from international students using Facebook as a way to communicate
Um, do you have any of I I mean, do you have issues using Facebook? No. <laughs> Not even that uh, they are actually selling your information to other companies. Okay. Yes, some. Uh, okay, I think for a good part of the world, they care a lot about privacy. Okay. I think you do. It's just that if you can get some free services, you don't mind sacrificing a little bit of privacy. Okay. Facebook. Um, I do know that uh, many of you uh, are on IG. All right, so I've been uh, asked a lot to, you know, start my IG account, but I'm still resisting it. All right, uh, just to tell you, uh, as a fact, Polly is not a very social person. Um, okay, that is still true. Time to time, I really like to be alone. I don't know about you. Some of you might be as well. It's actually okay. Sorry for talking too much, but uh, just uh, yeah, because it was a hard time last year. Okay, so and I was recording videos into the night, and I felt a little bit, you know, low and need to <laughs> bash things out. Really nice, if you think about it. Give it a try. And then searching. Uh, I don't have to say too much about this. Yeah, Google, um, Baidu. Um, yeah, there are just so many of them. Okay, so searching engines. And last, cloud computing. Hmm. Well, some people actually consider P2P uh, as a cloud computing services. Uh, and some also consider uh, streaming services over here, for example, Netflix, YouTube, also a cloud computing service. Um, because it's essentially a number of machines forming a cloud. So it's not quite entirely the internet, but it's a, you know, a subset of the internet there supporting the operation of a service. And that is not quite like the client service model. Hey, there's one system being client and another system being server. And there seems to be only two entities involving the service. So cloud computing in a very general uh, term, that means there's quite a bit of um, nodes involved, quite a bit of end systems involved, and they're forming this cloud. But these days, um, when people talk about uh, cloud computing, they might mean more specifically uh, Amazon's AWS service okay, or Microsoft's uh, Azure service. Yeah, so these are the cloud computing services. So these companies allow us to subscribe so that we get to operate uh, multiple machines that are physically across the world. So you could kind of uh, build your systems, build your content distribution network in a way. All right. So yeah, cloud computing, it's a term that's a bit fuzzy and sometimes general, sometimes more specific pointing to these cloud computing services. Well, they don't charge people though, okay. Right, so going through these examples, so just that you have a good con Text, a, a good context of what we're going to talk about. Okay, now implementing these uh, applications to create such uh, a network application, you do need to write programs. All right, so these programs will all be running on the end systems. So let me uh, bring up the animation. So end systems here, here. And here, okay, and they'll be communicating over the network like this, end to end, end system to end system. All right. So, um, for example, this guy here could be the web server, and this guy here could be using Safari uh, to look up the course page. And there's communication going through the internet such that the web request goes to the server, and web server here replies with the course page. All right, so you do have the web server software here running on the physical machine over here. And then you do have a Safari, the web browser software 
uh, that's implemented and running here on the end system. Okay, so programs are distributed, in fact, in a network application. And there's not going to be need to write a software so that it runs in the Internet core. So what are the Internet cores? Um, this is the Internet core. And there's not going to be any part of the software that involves operation of an application layer protocol that's going to go in here. This is actually a very nice consideration when we're designing how uh, to build network application because then we involve very little entities that we need to change in case we want to evolve or we want to update our application. Okay, so the core devices do not run the user applications. Therefore, when we want to make rapid changes, we don't have to change all the codes that's running here. So that will require every router here uh, to make changes. Okay, so if we want to make changes on the apps, designing it this way, having all the software running on the end systems, we just need to update and systems. Nice and independent. And that takes us to the first quiz. Today. Let's see, maybe we'll get to the second quiz today. Yeah, and some of you guys actually figure your way to see quiz number five already. Okay, so every year probably surveys uh, among the young generations. Okay. So that uh, she's not completely out of sync of the society. Um, and so a nice thing uh, teaching in college is that I do have access to you guys. <laughs> so here it goes. Q1, can you list the top two network applications you usually use okay, when you're using a PC or a laptop? Q2, list uh, the apps that you use on your smartphones. Okay, are they different? And then the two games you play, okay, on any of the platforms, uh, including platforms like uh, Nintendo Switch, like uh, yeah, PS5, because all these uh, game consoles are now also uh, networkable. In fact, the PS5, for example, it's a really high-end machine in a very low cost. So when I was still a grad student, I tried to install Linux on PS2, and it uh, works. All right, and you know what? And because some of you have already uh, discovered, oh okay, working out. I think some of you have already uh, the find your way into this quiz. So let's go there, and so we can start from there. So this one doesn't need to be a team effort because you guys might use two different, you know, apps, okay, for your own purpose. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Uh, anyhow, here says, oh, Twitch and Discord. Okay, so, yeah. You see you're leaking also a little of your privacy away. Okay, on smartphone, it's all social apps, right? Social network apps. Facebook, Instagram, IG, and game. Heartstone, I've heard about it, but uh, never played it. Okay, LOL, it's just so popular here. Do you play LOL? No? If you do, raise your hand. I just need to see how popular it is. Okay, I, I understand, I understand. Okay, good. Yeah, I know some of you are a little bit reserved, okay, trying to reveal what kind of game you play to, you know, old people. Uh, let's see. Uh, Wei, I think. Wei. Mm -hmm. Team number three. Okay, their choices are Line and Spotify. Oh, okay. On PC, okay. I thought that you use Spotify more on smartphone. Hmm. Both, okay. Sure, sure. Okay, YouTube and IG being on smartphone. What is this? Brawl Stars. Brawl Stars. Is it a shooting game? Anyone? Has, has anyone heard about this game? No? 
What was it? A strategy game? A smartphone game, of course. Okay, I, I guess it's a little bit hard to explain. Can maybe you can show me later during the break. Okay. And then Ethan, uh, Ethan representing Team 13 says, Discord and Messenger, okay, when he's on PC or laptop. Twitter, I see, Twitter and IG, okay, Twitter is very popular, it's a social net app as well. So predominantly you see on smartphone, people use social network apps. Clash Royale, okay. And Tetris. Okay. Do you know Tetris? Have you heard about the game? Yes? Interesting. Could you raise your hand if you are playing it? No. Okay, so I guess you just know about it. Yeah, there's a championship of Tetris. Uh, wait, Shu Yu. Okay, Shu Yu, I guess. Okay, Team 18. Steam. Oh, okay, that's a game platform. Okay. Uh, Discord. Messenger and IG, again, social network apps. Okay, I don't know about Valheim. Is that, um, actually, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And then two times jelly. Mm -hmm. Wait, no. Okay, uninstall. Remind me later. Okay, flash page. Okay, Discord, Twitch, and uh, Facebook, WeChat. WeChat. Okay. And Dota too. Dark Souls. Interesting. YouTube, Facebook. So it seems that on the laptop and PC, you use the video apps more, right? Because uh, you get bigger screen, it looks a little bit easier. Uh, Angela, Gmail. Hmm. Okay, doing serious business, I suppose. Car Rider Rush Plus. Okay. Sims 4. So are these console games or mobile games? Console game, mobile games? Jing here? Jing here? <laughs> Netflix. Ah, okay. We don't play games. <laughs> I knew that some of you would say this. Okay. Pay. <laughs> and uh, pay is Netflix, YouTube, again, video uh, streaming services. Okay. Facebook, IG. BTS World. I thought. Is that the Korean band? The boy band? Is that a game? Interesting. How do you play the game? You dance with it, I guess. Amount is. Uh, I see, you know, there are different tastes uh, in choosing games. LOL again. Uh -huh. Scientist 2. Wow. Kevin. YouTube, Google, Facebook, Instagram, Dark Souls Witcher. Okay, so this is different from the the other Dark Souls, right? So there are so many games these days and they all sound a little bit alike. Hey, but no, Team One, you give me only one game. So I ask for two. Oh, okay, so it's Dark Soul, Common, Witcher. Okay, good. Like, I know what they are, but... <laughs> okay, James here says, Seldom play games, sorry. Oh, you don't have to be sorry. Do you see me? Do you see me? Sorry. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, because you cannot provide two apps okay, for poly survey. I understand. That's very kind of you. Fortune City. Okay, again, only one game. Oh, dot, 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 probably multiple ones. And so, or are you missing a column between Fortune and City? <laughs> Yeah, so very common, right? We see video apps for PC, laptop, and then the social net apps on smartphone. Games I see very diverse these days. Saiba, NTU mail. Jingyue, where are you? <laughs> Remotely, I know, right? Okay, let me see if Jing is here. Yeah, you're here. Oh, you work too hard. Okay, study very hard. Okay, so that's what? That should be what? Crocodile and sunglasses. Crocodile with the sunglasses. Okay, but hey, you also have fun, right? So that's very long names for the games. Sid Meier's Civilization. Six, Age of Empire. Oh, wow. Definitive edition. Whatever that means. Huh, interesting. What is this? Uh, X-Term, right? It's one of the X-Terminals. Are you here, Guangzhou? Yeah. It's one of the terminals. Is it nice? Stable? Convenient. Does it handle Chinese characters well? No? Not that good. Okay. But uh, you're using it for other purposes, not to access PPT. Are you using it mainly for PPT? No. Age of Empire, FIFA, 2021. And Jia. Hogwarts Mystery. Oh, okay. Only one. Okay, that sounds like a novel from KJ Rowland. <laughs> and then Yuzi. In Shang Kong, Tom carries hot pot. Okay. I guess it's a lot of fun. I see. <laughs> it was really fun, I have to say. He does look like Thompson, right? Oh. All right, good. Uh, thank you for the contribution. But this is not yet a game yet, no? Is it? <laughs> it is a game now. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, from Yi Hao. Is this a game? Yeah. Would you recommend that I play? Yeah, it's a game. Oh, oh, wow, it's from GitHub. Oh, my. Okay. Would it take a lot of time? <laughs> Is it? Chao Ji Jian Dan would be better for me. Dian An Ying Mu. But I cannot see where Heng Gan is. Okay, so is this long enough? Nineteen point three three. It looks like fun. 
All right. Good to know that you guys also have a life after classes. And yeah, so, okay, just so that I know a little bit about the apps you're using. Okay, so you also see that uh, on PC laptops, okay, um, mobile devices, uh, you do different things. Are you spending more time playing games on smartphones versus uh, PC laptops? Think about it. If you spend more time playing games on mobile platforms, raise your hand. Uh, more on the laptops, PCs, raise your hand. Mm -hmm. Okay, about equal. Mm -hmm. But you see, um, this is very significant. Why? It used to be that all play on PC. And now let's resume. All right, let's come back to the lecture. 2.1, principles of network applications. Let's first talk about the architecture. Uh, there are three options. Uh, we'll talk about content distribution network later in the chapter. So first is client server, second, peer to peer. And there's actually a third one. Some applications actually implement using this client server P2P hybrid architecture. You'll see an example in a little bit. So, client server architecture. So, what you're seeing here is these are server, these are clients. All right? So, the characteristic of the servers are these. These are end systems that are always on. Um, if you think back, when you're working on PA1, no matter whether it's the day, it's the night, or it's the midnight, um, hey, that workstation, 140112.42.161, for this semester, is always running. Okay. And it's on a permanent IP address. I just recited the IP address. I don't want to you know, do it again. Always on, permanent IP. That is the major characteristic of these servers. Servicing end systems. And sometimes uh, when the service is really, really large, okay, so for PAs, you just need one server. Um, for example, if uh, you are using a Gmail account, uh, emailing me, yeah, Gmail servers, woo, it actually takes a whole data center. Inside the data center, there are often hundreds of these server machines, hundreds of these workstations. Uh, it might take a huge data center in order to scale, to make sure that it can serve billions of users uh, and um, you know sending emails simultaneously. All right, so that was server. Usually very big machines, expensive machines. Clients, on the other hand, yeah, of course they communicate with the server, but uh, unlike servers always on, clients are often more intermittently connected. So car here, having a pad as it travels through, uh, 4G connectivity might be weak or strong and weak again and disconnected and strong again. Yeah, that is very unstable, intermittently connected client. And very likely, uh, you guys are connecting to the internet using um, your smartphone through various IP addresses. It actually depends on where you go. On campus, if you are connecting to NTU PEEP, then NTU PEEP give you one IP address. That's going to be starting from 140112, because you are on campus of NTU. As you walk out to have lunch, then it might be running on 4G, then it really depends on who's your uh, phone service provider. Then it could be operating on something like 72 dot something dot something. All right. So as you go uh, the whole day, you might be using um, a handful of these uh, IP addresses. And clients do not communicate directly to each other. Uh, rather, they connect to the servers. Now, those 
clients who connect to each other are then working in this alternative architecture, the peer-to-peer -peer architecture. So you see the elements involved here in a P2P application are simply hmm, weak end systems. We're not seeing these big machines uh, involving in a P2P application. Yep, sorry. In P2P architecture, well, maybe I don't need to say sorry that much. Um, yeah, back to the lecture. Uh, in P2P applications, there are no longer anyone being always on. All right, all of us are clients, but we are clients trying to help each other. Okay? People helping people. So we have arbitrary end systems directly communicating to each other. So the peers are helping each other, requesting help from each other, uh, request services from other peers, and other peers uh, provide services in return. And the fact is that this peer asking for the service might also be requested by other peer here uh, for services. So again, people helping people. So these guys uh, helping each other. These guys helping each other. And again, helping each other. What's really nice about uh, communicating this way or providing services this way is this. Self scalability. You see, because if I join a P2P network, Let's assume Polly is this laptop. Okay, I can I can request services from this desktop. Okay, so let me see. I want this web page, for example, and let's assume that the web is P2P. Uh, what's gonna happen is, hey, this guy here or this guy here can also be requesting the web pages that I have already downloaded because I have a copy of it, right? So why don't I pro uh, why don't I provide the web page to you know other guys so that's called the p2p i give you a hand and you being helped by me uh, manage to finish pa1 then you can go on and help other teams for the pa1 so I'm not saying that you want to copy uh, each other's uh, assignments but just you know what i'm saying so you guys teaching each other or you know helping each other uh, to find out what is the um, username and password for the team account. Yeah, that's P2P helping. There's a self-scalability in terms of whenever I join the network and asking for services, I'm also providing my capacity to help others for the service. So new peer brings new service capacity uh, as well as new service demands. So. Yeah, I'll be requesting services, I'll be asking for resources, but I'm also paying back with my resources. So many people like P2P, especially young people like P2P, because it's kind of fair. Okay. Um, so, I mean, if I have resource, right, why not just help each other? Okay. Yeah, another characteristic of P2P being self-scalable is also that there's no need of setting up servers which are expensive devices to require people to maintain. So a lot of these P2P services are also free. So as you join the community, you get some services from the others, but you also contribute later. It's a little bit like when you guys are on Slack, right? So I see some students working on PA3 already, and they run into troubles. They share openly right, what kind of troubles they went through. So in case the rest of you okay, started a little bit late, ran into the same problem, then your issue is already addressed. You don't have to direct message Polly again. You see, so I teach one of you guys, and you guys help spread out okay, what is the question and what was the answer. Um, so I guess uh, this is a very effective way of propagating knowledge, okay, propagating information as well. Although that uh, you have to be careful, okay, uh, fake news okay, is something that get easily spread out on P2P network like this. Mm -hmm. So 
or forums or uh, private groups, okay, you easily spread things without thinking too much. Okay. All right, so let's take a break now, and uh, this is also the time that we'll do, we'll do the Google uh, Me session testing. Uh, by the way, guys, Caleb is here, <laughs> so, okay, yeah, so, 同神端火锅, okay. Hmm, how do you translate that? <laughs> really? Roger A A B B C C, but that was the ID of the. Okay. Okay, so um, guys, uh, if you guys uh, plan to take the exams from a remote site, make sure that you join the Google Me session. And the rest of us. If you plan to come and take the exams, just uh, take a break. Exam one. I think the link is up here. I think this one. Yeah. to join. <laughs> Just the two of us. Yeah. Uh, I hope that uh, there will be some of you planning to take uh, the exams remotely. Oh, there you go. And this is um, uh, Jingxiang. Hi. And Jingyuan. Good. Okay. Okay, Jingxiang, your camera is good. Okay, very clear. Lu Yuanxiang. So, Yuanxiang, Jingyuan, would you like to try out your camera? Oh, by the way, make sure you, you know, dress up. <laughs> uh, I see Ethan. Okay, good. Yuan Xiang, you're good. And uh, by the way, uh, those who plan to take the exams remotely, uh, please do come. Uh, join the video session 10 minutes before the exam so that we could check on the... Uh, <laughs> so we could check your ID, student ID, okay? So, oh, that there... Yeah, so they just, you know, play, you just hold up your student ID like this, okay, and then uh, place it in front of the camera. So we just need to compare the photos. Oh, okay, I was uh, uh, taking video from the side. <laughs> okay, good. So Shi Wei is demonstrating it perfectly. Great. Ethan, very good. Yu Xiang, very good. Okay, good. So I guess the, all are working, and we do have at least four students, okay, voluntarily. Okay, and then the Shen Yu, right? So at least five students voluntarily taking the exam remotely. So we'll be fine. Phew. Yu Zhe as well. Okay, Jing Yuan, your camera is working. Perfect. Okay, we see your ID. Good. Okay, so those who finished testing, uh, you can feel free to log out if you want. Okay, bye. All right, bye. So you do just need to um, try the camera, I guess. <laughs> Because 
Oh, that's okay. It's actually a bit awkward because I actually have another <laughs> interview tomorrow afternoon, and uh-huh. the guy scheduled it right uh, at the time when we were supposed to do the exactly. uh, our, our meeting. Oh, okay. Yeah, our thesis oh, meeting. Okay, okay. Yeah, so I was thinking that we move it after the exam on Thursday. Okay, okay, that's fine. That's fine. Uh-huh. But I do have a meeting at three thirty. Okay, so I'll make 4:30, it. Four thirty, so four thirty to. Okay, okay, that that'll, that'll be also okay. So do it after four thirty. Right. Uh, or after the exam, uh, exam ends two thirty, two twenty or two thirty. Yeah, that might be a little bit. That that might be a little bit too rushed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then then we we'll do it after four thirty. Okay, it's a uh, you're good, but it's a uh, so the lights is a little bit uh, yeah. So there are reflections, but we can see you generally. So I think you're okay. Uh, do you know how to mute your mic? You can put the microphone on. So during the exam, you might want to turn off the mic. You can put the microphone on. Just in the exam, if you have any questions, you can turn the microphone on. There you go. All right, good. All right, so I guess that's all. That's all, Caleb. Feel free to. So Thursday, I'll also be working. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. Yeah. Um, cause um, I don't know, right? Yes. If you are remote, then um. Yeah, I, I think I I'll, I'll be here because it's more convenient.
Hey, it's time. Let's resume the lecture. All right, so peers in a P2P network uh, unfortunately needs to be intermittently connected. Uh, there's, it's going to be very hard. You guys stay sticking to the same IP address. So the IP address is, is going to be changing. So one of the big headache designing a P2P application is this. Management of the peers. Right? So if this is poly, and I'm running suddenly from IP address number one to number two, uh, there needs to be some sort of directory uh, such that it maintains what's my current IP address. So my friend here uh, will be able to contact me smoothly. Okay. Ended up, uh, we have a complex uh, architecture using P2P in the end. Uh, you'll see later the BitTorrent a BitTorrent example how complex it can be. Now the third kind, the hybrid client server and P2P. Oh, okay, this is actually a very good example to talk about how P2P can be complicated, and some application chooses a hybrid architecture such that the complicated part, the directory lookup part, the IP address lookup part. Okay, is client server based. So in Skype, okay, so Skype is actually hybrid P2P and uh, client server. It actually maintains centralized servers, and in fact, multiple of them, so that when we are logged in into Skype, uh, we see this directory of our friends that we might need, uh, we might need to make a call to. Yeah, well, once we click on the friend's head, what it does is uh, the central server here would look up what is the current IP address of your friend and then inform your program. Yeah, the program sitting on your um, laptop or sitting on your mobile phone. What is the IP address that you need to call to directly? Okay, so you're calling your friend's IP address directly. So the calling part is P2P, but the lookup part the part that you need to look up the IP address of your friend, that part is client server. Interesting, isn't it? All right, so that's the architecture of applications. Let's talk about uh, process communication. So we do have sometimes, you know, especially applications running in the client server model. We have the client process, we have the server process, and these processes we need to communicate. P2P applications, peer, peer processes, uh, they could be the same program, but they also need to communicate. So processes running on a host uh, in the internet will then have to communicate with other processes also on the internet. Now, if the two processes are running on the same computer, there are other ways of doing the communication. If you know operating system well, you know that there are sometimes call you can make, just you know, like command line function calls we often use, such as um, CD, MKDIR, creating directories. So there are command line um, functions you could call that allow you to do this inter-process communication. You don't necessarily send messages. Uh, instead, you call a function and provide certain parameters. Okay. Now, on the internet, however, for processes that are sitting on different hosts, then we do need to exchange messages. Okay. So, client and server, each will have uh, its own process. The client process oftentimes is the one initiating communication, because server is always um, just sitting there, right? Server does not say, hey guys, uh, would you like to see this web page or not? No. Yeah. Client uh, issue requests for a page. Server sitting there waits for a connection request, waits to be connected, waits to be contacted. So one is passive, uh, the other needs to be active. So in client server model, this is very obvious. In peer-to-peer -peer model, however, one is actually actively probing another peer. Um, well, 
they are sitting there, but hey, it's barely um, it's barely satisfying the definition of a server. So um, we don't call a peer process a server process, and because uh, a peer also provides services, so we don't call uh, the peer process a client process. So therefore, we call these P2P applications processes the peer process, right? So applications with the P2P architecture will have peer processes. In these peer processes, we'll be implementing both the client and the server functions. All right, so basic architectures of application layer protocols, how they communicate. And essentially the two parts, client server, each of them is a process. More about the processes. Now, our processes will be sending messages to each other and through this thing, socket. So, yeah, you might be thinking, why socket? Why is this term keeps popping up, right? Yeah, um, you know, you can think of it this way. Uh, how do we call, um, you know, this thing, right? This is the eye socket. What does that mean? Okay, that is the entry point uh, of lights. Uh, we have a um, power socket. What is power socket for? It's um, where you plug in, right? The power plug. So here, socket or network socket is where uh, you push messages through. Okay or you take messages out. So that is why we call this thing um, network socket. All right, so it's sort of a gateway of messages. Good. So socket here, another analogy is, yeah, it's almost like the doorway. We send messages over the door. Okay, so sending process shoves messages out the door. Sending process also rely on the transport layer service that's right underneath to deliver whatever the message that we shop out of the door. All right. So again, we see transport infrastructure. So application here only handles passing the message to the socket. Application there um, sometimes do not do too does not do too much controlling. The, the speed of sending these messages out. Um, more often, we have the transport layer service here to support okay, adjusting the sending rates of these uh, messages. All right, so uh, in the figure below, we see application layer process sitting in the application layer. So one is sender, one is receiver. Messages go through the socket, being shoved through the socket, and it goes through the internet and reaching the other way. So this socket here wraps the message and passes it up to the process. And that's how the receiver gets the message. Right? Uh, for different languages, you see different APIs to do sending, receiving. Uh, in Golan, you will see that the very basic one is simply read okay, for the receiver. Uh, the basic one for sending is simply write for the sender. There will be a lot more in the PA assignments. Now, the last point, yeah, the protocol stack from the physical layer all the way up to the transport layer. These are all controlled by the operating system. Once you have installed Windows, once you have installed Mac OS or Unix, Ubuntu or Linux, whichever you like, you've already installed the entire suite okay, of the protocol up to the transport layer. Now, the application layer protocol, however, is controlled by the application developers. All right. So once you set up your laptop, yeah, nowadays uh, it came with the um, 
came with a web browser, IE or Safari. But IE and Safari, if you look at it, it's actually also a separate application. Uh, you can actually remove it and still um, your operating system can still operate. So, uh, well, why web? Uh, the protocol that's implemented in the web browser is controlled by the app developer. It goes, it comes with the app. Okay, so separation of the application layer protocol and the other protocols. Other protocols in the operating system, application layer protocols apart of the apps that you are downloading. Now, to identify processes uh, uniquely, um, now think this way, to receive a message, you need to really have an identifier so that uh, it, the messages will go to the rifle process. There could be multiple processes running on a host. If we are only sending the messages to the host's IP address only, then how does the host know that, hey, which process, right, the message is for? Okay, so question, does IP address of the host sufficient for identifying the process? Well, hey, you guys are thinking this, obviously. No, right, there could be multiple processes running on the host. So the identifier uh, definitely needs to have the IP address so that the message goes to the right host. But that's not the only component needs to be in the identifier. We also need a special number. Uh, in this case, the poor number. Okay. On the internet, we call this address to identify individual process on the machine. The poor number. So. To identify a process, it's a combination of IP address plus the port numbers. So an example port number for some of the well-known processes. So if you run a very powerful machine and you could implement or install an HTTP server, which is also the web server. Now web server uh, is given a default port, port number 80. Mail server, port number 25. Um, SSH, I think it's uh, 21 or something like that. Okay. So there are well-known services in the world, HTTP, mail, uh, remote logging, that operate, operates on the well-known port numbers. Right. So to send HTTP messages to, for example, this web server, um, this is the IP address of Gaia.ums.edu and because web server is oftentimes just running on the default port 80. So to send a web request, uh, you take this combination and that's going to identify the web server processes running on Gaia. Right. So there's going to be more uh, later on in chapter 2. Let's take a pause here um, just to check whether Polly's recording is um, going well. All right, so let's also take a pause here. By the way, core number for SSH, I, th I think I misrecall it as 21. It should be 22, right? It's 422. Web server default is 80. That's why if you go to dot 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 google dot com, you don't need to specify a port number, right? Because web server is a process, right? Running on a machine. Uh, this is the host name of the search engine. Does it doesn't contain a port number? Okay, if you just say, hey, I want to go here. Is that hey, there's a port, default port number. If there's no port number specified, then it always goes to port 80. Sometimes we run servers outside of port 80. Uh, for example, A0, A0. Oh, yeah, this is how you specify port number. If uh, the web server process is running on a separate port, not the default port. 
So, internet is not just IP addresses. Okay, there are also these port numbers. They are quite important as well. I see if there are questions here. No, good. And let's move on. And so uh, the next segment is about the messages will be shuffling through the sockets, okay, and from the processes to processes. So you see that uh, at the beginning of each chapter, you guys are introduced with a lot of these terms, okay, technical terms, and each of them have specific uh, meanings. Unfortunately, we have enough time to cover this. The application layer protocol, what's defined in a protocol like this? First thing, well, application layer protocols are essentially exchanging messages between the processes. So we need to define a type of messages that we exchange. Now, you see earlier, I often use the web as an example. So we said web requests, as a result, the server sends back. The web response. So there are two types of messages. Now depending on how complicated your application layer protocol is, um, there could be more than two types of messages. And then we need to define the syntax of these messages. Uh, for example, web response might say, um, okay everything is fine, um, one, uh, 101. Okay. And sometimes it says, oh something is wrong. 403. Yeah, some of you might have seen uh, messages like that saying, hey, yeah, page not found, 404. Okay, so those are message syntax. So there are special things or fields in the messages uh, that's telling the client uh, what's going on at the server. What is the service being requested? Is it okay? Am I providing the services? And what time I'm providing the service? And um, when, is the uh, when is the service last available? And when is the last time you have requested the services? So there are all sorts, of, all sorts of things these messages might be defining and indicating the status of the exchange. All right, so oftentimes multiple fields, not just the type of message, not just uh, the, you know, the specific uh, status uh, of the service, but also time, um, operating system of the server, etc. And then, hey, I use 404 as an example. What does that mean? Yeah, in the protocol, uh, what's also defined is that uh, for these code words, uh, they are often short for communication purpose. Uh, but behind each number, uh, behind each special term, there might be quite a bit, there might be quite a set of uh, semantics. So, meaning of information in these fields. Are you guys familiar with the 404 message? 404? Mm -hmm. uh, meaning of it or semantic of that message is file not found or page not found. And then, um, last but not the least, the rules about exchanging the messages. Uh, the server process might be sending back a response after it receives a request. Okay. But some um, applications such as P2P, these exchanges of uh, messages can be a lot more complicated. So typically in an application layer protocol, you see we need to define um, how many messages and define the types. Define fields in each of these messages so that they can provide the important information to the other side. And for engineers like us uh, to understand what is the meaning of these special code words, special keywords, and then uh, the flow of how these messages gets exchanged. Gets exchanged. Now these protocols can be categorized based on whether um, all these rules, definitions are provided open to the public or private, um, so it's, it's more secretive. Uh, some of these popular applications we know are open, 
So there's this document, RFC, Request for Comment. Uh, each protocol has one of these RFCs. Some protocols, more complicated, will have multiple RFCs. If you look up one of these RFCs and read the counter, and you'll see, wow, ah, there's a lot of details uh, one needs to put in, a lot of effort there in order for one to implement, for example, a web browser such that uh, it will interoperate uh, with any web servers on the internet. So web servers can have different implementations, just like web browsers can have implement different implementations. We have Safaris, uh, Chrome, uh, Firefox, etc., etc. Each of these web browsers need to be able to work with each of the existing web servers, Apache, Nginx, etc. All right. Now, you see, web, HTTP is one such open protocol. Therefore, we see a rich a variety of these uh, processes that we could download and uh, install. Email also, right? Email readers, there are, nowadays there are many, many different forms. One can also download free email server as well as proprietary email servers. Now, the email readers and all these email servers will need to be able to interoperate. With protocols being open, we could have a variety of them working together. So what's nice about this is such that, hey, better programmers, better teams show up, they could actually improve, improve the performances of the servers or the client. Uh, therefore, we get faster web services, faster email services. Now, proprietary protocol, yeah, it's all secretive. You can find any definition of it. But uh, sometimes uh, hackers who are a bit bored may try to hack. I think some 10 years ago when Skype just showed up, because uh, it was super hot, because uh, it worked quite amazingly. People worldwide can uh, just call each other for free. So there were some hackers trying to uh, sort of backward engineer Skype's client, and therefore they could implement uh, some other clients, allowing other people to call up um, using Skype. Um, that was a very ambitious project. I've tried it. Uh, it kind of worked. But uh, Skype learned about that uh, hacked uh, client and then quickly changed something, and that uh, hacked version stopped working. So. That's what's wrong with the secretive protocol. But that's also right about the uh, that's also what's nice about the secretive uh, protocols because then it will fend away all the competitors. Okay, so until today, Skype is still Skype. Uh, there's only one Skype program that you download. Uh, but we do have other forms of competitions. Nowadays, we download Line. We could also download Google Hangout. Um, yeah, but your friends will have to, you know, uh, switch to these other platforms. Good. So that's going to be all for um, this week. Um, I'm just going to... All right. So that's not quite yet all for this week. Okay. Uh, there'll be more videos coming up. And we'll switch gear and talk about something slightly different. It's called quality of service. Okay. This has something to do with... Application layer protocol is in fact interacting with the protocol right underneath it. And that was the what, transport layer. So application is high up. layer protocol is also uh, to find out right which of the services provided by the transport layers the application layer protocol should use so we've seen earlier right so oh there are two different type of uh, communication models like client versus server and the other is uh, connecting tiers versus peers a communication model we talked about defining the protocol essentially you define the message types Right, formats, semantics, and the actions you take after receiving messages or after sending messages. But all these talk about the application layer protocol. 
a part of the application layer protocol design is that, okay, so there's specific data we want to send, and depending on the nature of it, we might need to choose the underlying supporting services a little bit more carefully. Because in the transport layer, we do have multiple services. TCP, TCP. So this is the part, okay, in the overview of chapter two that talks about the relationship between the application layers and the transport layers. Um, excuse the sudden change of costume here. Polly is doing the recordings the next day. Um, and let's come back in. Uh, we're at a transport layer service. Uh, and that's, that is flashback a little bit. So we're now trying to design the network application. And we've discussed, um, you need to first decide uh, what is the architecture? Okay. Is it server client? Is it the peer peer? And then you want to think about what language you want to use to program the app. And you learn that the processes uh, running on the end systems will be transferring messages to this thing called socket. Um, so after the socket, the messages will be going to the operating system. And the, at the top of the operating system is what? The transport layer. And that is the thing we need to decide here. Uh, there are multiple choices. Which one do you pick? Yeah, it depends on this thing, the nature of the application you're trying to design. So that includes the content types. Are you transmitting text? Are you transmitting audio, video? Are you transmitting game data? It also depends on the use. Uh, is it more interactive or not interactive at all? It also depends on the user expectation. Yeah, sometimes the users are more used to you know, quick service, a very high volume service, they might be demanding more. Right? So uh, to what level quality you want to provide your applications? Uh, those are called the quality of service. The first is called the data integrity in the textbook, but what the, the authors of the textbook meant is reliability. Okay. So the text content here is the one that's particularly interesting and requiring 100% reliability. This type of content is very vulnerable to loss. Let me give you an example. Let's say you want to send a message back to the home universities uh, telling your friends that, hey, NTU is a really cool university. So you say, NTU rocks. But if you're choosing a service, a uh, transport layer service that's not reliable, then hey, let's say these two characters got lost. Then this is subject to interpretation, isn't it? Yeah, your friend there might be mistaken that as NTU sucks. Uh. That would be the exact opposite of what you meant to say. Well, not to mention, hey, it actually looks <laughs> similar to the F words, isn't it? So that is just to show you that text-based content, uh, most of the time, we just set it to 100% reliability. So we pick a service that uh, provides 100% reliability. Now, Audio video, particularly audio video streams, then can tolerate to losses. As you're transmitting a stream of audio or video, if we lost a segment in the middle, if it's short enough, um, what human brains can do is to try to fill the gap in with the context before and after the loss. So those apps can potentially be loss tolerant. And the next service requirement that people often talk about is timing. Uh, this is better known as this, delay. Um, most of the applications does not require strict delay, but this type of application does require low delay. The interactive applications, so internet, 
telephony as well as uh, shooting games. First uh, person shooting games particularly are very interactive. And those applications require very short delay. Uh, the delay needs to be lower than 100 milliseconds in order uh, to make sure that the receiver of a message or a receiver of a audio stream to think that you are saying it right now. And so they can talk back quickly. They can fire back quickly. Right? Those with high reflex might argue, hey, the delay needs to be lower than this. Yeah, as I said, my first person shooting game. Someone with, with really, really good uh, reflexive, ooh, they can tell. Uh, they can react real, real quick. If you are playing a first person shooting game with your friend, would you prefer that you have short delay? Or do you mind having long delay? And your friends all have short delay. Or your enemies all have short delay. Okay, so there are certain applications. The nature is that hey, it only works, and people will only want it because delay is low. And some other applications, people will want it because, yeah, it's gonna deliver data reliably. Right. So, uh, timing requirement, delay, so to speak. Third is throughput. Um, I think a better way to call this is bandwidth. Okay, can we provide certain amount of bandwidth uh, to transmit the content? Uh, the network bandwidth in particular. So some applications do require a good amount of network bandwidth in order for it to work effectively. So this is uh, yeah streaming video. As you are watching here. A streamed video. Uh, what I'm trying to send out is this much, okay? 200 megabits per second. Uh, YouTube recommends a minimum of this much, one megabit per second. Now, if you are seeing the quality is already not that good, you see that one megabit is going to be worse. Now, anything lower than one megabit per second. Uh, you might not bother because the video quality is not so good, is it? Well, by the way, for this semester, because I'm accessing through wireless network, so my transmission rate is already close to one megabit per second. So uh, if you want to be a streamer in the future, okay, streaming, for example, like a Tongshan game, yeah, definitely make sure that you connect to wired uh, internet so that you guarantee you're guaranteeing your viewers a better quality video. Do you mind watching videos in lower resolution at all? You do? Some do, some not. Mm. I guess it also depends on the users, right? Yeah. So you see also a little bit of the user expectation here. Because mm. um, we are pretty much spoiled. Um, for a Ethernet fixed wire network, you definitely expect very high throughput, very high network bandwidth, and you are used to high quality video. So when it suddenly you move to 4G, then hey, that video might not be effective at all, not satisfying at all, right? But other than videos, uh, most of the other applications are elastic, meaning there's no strict requirement that you want to guarantee a certain network bandwidth. Right? So they will just make use of whatever throughput they get. All right. So do you mind if uh, the email arrive at the, at the receiver in a day? You probably do. Mm -hmm. How about an hour? Mm -hmm. Probably okay. Yeah. So it also has a lot to do with uh, how we are provided services previously as well. Mm. Last uh, service requirement: security. Now this is actually something that's uh, growingly important. Uh, in 
in the 90s and the early 2000s, security was not even a service uh, requirement at all. As at the time, uh, people are yet to worry about providing better throughput, better timing services, better data integrity. Only re these recent years, people are more aware about security issues, therefore begin to demand uh, we provide enough security in the applications. And that includes two kinds of security. One is confidentiality. Are we encrypting data? Are we encrypting the messages so that uh, people cannot hack uh, what we're doing? The other type of security is this, data integrity. This is so that we can prevent any third party from spoofing our data and pretending to be the sender and send something uh, that means uh, uh, mislead us, okay? falsified information. So all four together, service requirements or also called the quality of service. So a big part of uh, the, network the network layer protocol design is uh, to decide first, what is the quality of service that we're trying to provide, all right? So this part of the design is not technical. It's more that you need to think for your user. You need to think for the services such that the users using the application will be happy. It's a little bit tricky, yeah, because you kind of need to know your market and then uh, decide better what to do. Now let's go through some common apps and uh, look through the service requirements for these apps. Uh, first app, file transfer. Uh, this is a very classic app as most of the files contain text. So here, no loss. Now the file transfers oftentimes does not require uh, it being sent in a timely fashion. So no. Uh, delay requirement is not time sensitive at all. As a result, there is no need of bandwidth guarantee. The bandwidth can be very, very low, uh, but uh, we are not expecting it arriving at a specific time anyway, so it's very elastic. So things like Dropbox, uh, when you uh, move a file into your Dropbox folder, you see that Dropbox there might be doing the uploading. Uh, for days, as you know, most of our household network, the uplink bandwidth is very narrow. Okay. Now, similarly, you can probably project email, web documents being also text, um, then we demand no loss. And there's no delay requirement, therefore, there's no specific bandwidth requirement. Real-time audio video, however, very different. As we were talking just now, there are loss tolerant, right? Because if we miss just a short fragment, we could actually fill in ourselves. And for interactive audio video, what's even more interesting is that, hey, when we were speaking over internet phone service, if I miss something you say, I'll just say, hey, hello, you were breaking up last sentence. Could you repeat that? In a way, huh, the human beings can serve as uh, a reliable service on top of the internet, on top of your app. Okay. So, um, no loss, not that important. Instead, let's tolerate loss for audio video apps. But, hey, real-time audio video, we do demand a certain bandwidth guarantee. So, audio in particular demands lower. Uh, 5 kilobits per second should be sufficient, but anything lower than that, it's not really audible, perceivable. Video requirements is higher, 10 kilobits per second minimum, but the quality was really, 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 really bad. Okay? Uh, it's probably okay for a real-time video conference so that you just see the facial expression. Well, sometimes with 10 kilobits per second, you don't see the subtle facial expression. Yeah, but, and these days, hey, uh, spoiled users might be demanding this much. Very good quality video, uh, very good quality audio. Guys, those who said that you use Spotify a lot, 
Do you hear the sound quality? A lot. So what do you what do you listen? Okay, if you're listening to only pop music, pop songs, versus classic or metal. So even within audio, mm. or it's just human speech. So these are music. Human speech. They can imagine the human speech, the requirement is lower. I mean, you don't care all that much about the details in the sound wave. But for others, you do. Right? I think the metal people also care because uh, they want to hear that vibration thing, right? That raw vibration thing. So yeah, therefore there's a So I was just listening to an online concert from Berlin Philharmonic. Yeah, I would really yeah prefer a higher bit rate for those audio streams. You see, and delay sensitivity. Um yeah, because their real time applications very much sensitive to delay, and we want the delay to be lower than a hundred millisecond. Now. Store audio video is slightly different from real-time audio video, uh, and it differs here. The tolerance of delay. It is delay sensitive. If you're watching Netflix um, on a daily basis, you'll see. Uh, although you do not require that uh, it's real-time, but you do want the video being placed smoothly. Uh, as the network bandwidth fluctuates, you can only tolerate to a certain amount of these fluctuates. So what Netflix and YouTube, these type of stored audio video services are doing is to, hey, have a startup delay. So once you click into a Netflix video, you see that it's waiting, it's buffering. Yeah, for a few uh, seconds. Yeah, that's the delay we were talking about here. Yes, it's delay sensitive, but it's not as sensitive as the real-time audio video streaming services, all right? Oh, by the way, it's delay sensitive, it's because, hey, you don't want to wait for a minute, right, for the video to start playing. Good. Next is the games. Uh, most of the games are interactive. So you see, delay requirement, back to yes and 100 milliseconds. Um, game data, the volume is much lower than the audio videos. So we do see, we need some guarantee, but it's very low. Maybe just a couple kilobits per second. And uh, some, in some cases, uh, the game data are to a loss tolerant. But recently, the games are growing really complex. Uh, you might want to think about this again. Older games, uh, loss tolerance. But recent games or a new game that you'll be designing, you want to ponder real hard before you decide whether you use a reliable service or a non-reliable service. Last is text messaging. Well, you will not be surprised that, hey, we see no loss here. And text messages, very, very brief, very short. It's unlike game. Game is actually a stream of short packets, a stream, continuous streams of game data. Okay, It's just that the game data is not as big as the audio video data. Now, text messages, very, very short, even smaller than a file, email, or web. So very elastic, no bandwidth requirement. Now, delay requirement. Uh, in text messaging, it's really getting complex also these days. In the older days, um, I don't know if you heard about this uh, text messaging app called ICQ. ICQ. That's actually um, a means uh, I seek you. Uh, I'm looking for you. So in this app, when I was playing it the first time, 
I type a, a message, type up a message to my friend. I didn't get it, uh, get a reply in another day. So, uh, in the older days, people are not expecting very timely reply. But these days, uh, people are using these texting apps so often, uh, and many of us are using it in professional communication. Then, real time feedback is required. Okay, in some cases. So that was common apps and the service requirements. All right, and that was the end of the lecture today. And uh, Thursday is uh, exam, so do show up in time. Uh, questions? Questions from YouTube? Okay, good. If not, then that's all. Okay, go, go. Okay. Guys, it's time to go.